Am I too harsh on media? Very funny. Yep, you're all excellent comedians I know. Get it out of your system. Criticism is one of the most important tools to help any form of media to improve. It's a force that, when used well, can guide people into seeing a product from a different angle and create that drive to master one's craft. Whether it's making cartoons, film, video games, whatever, without criticism, it'd be very easy to fall into the idea that everything you make is perfect just the way it is, and there's nothing you could ever do to improve upon it. And let's be real, acting like any product is perfect helps nobody, and honestly can halt amazing people from giving out the best work they can make. Saying that, however, there is a point to be made about the line where we go from being critical about the things we consume, to being harsh or expecting too much. Being a YouTuber who focuses on talking about various types of media, I see this discussion being brought up a lot. Well, I mean, it's less of a discussion and more of a blanket statement to try and dismiss any kind of negativity, but that's besides the point. This is something I oftentimes ask myself. I've been on this site for a good few years now, so it's no secret that I'm not the most positive guy around, and people are sure to make me aware of this. I find myself making a review of a new movie or a game that's just come out and give my thoughts on it, only to be met with countless comments every month claiming that I'm overall very negative, being because I'm unfairly harsh on media and don't go into talking about something with an open mind. It comes up so much that it's something I think about a bunch or have conversations with friends of art, because it always stumped me. Am I too harsh? Well, I don't really intend to be, it's not like I go out of my way to view stuff in such a lens, but does that even excuse it? And the conversation usually plays out in my head the same way every time, with the conclusion always being, Uh... I don't know. If you couldn't already tell, this is gonna be a much more personal video than I've ever made. I more often than not like to stay focused on the video topic and rarely deviate from it, but I'm at a point now where I've collected my thoughts over time and built a fairly conclusive opinion on where I stand on the matter and feel like, eh, why not? I almost never get to talk about myself or my experiences on being a YouTuber, so why not go all out on it? And I want to make it clear, I'm not attempting to throw a pity party here or anything. At no point do I want you to look at this and think I'm a special little snowflake complaining about the way my stuff is perceived. I'm fully aware that the people who have this belief of me are never going to change their mind, and that's okay, genuinely. But I don't know, I think the discussion is fun, and this will only allow you to further understand the way I approach this sort of stuff. When you spent the last 20 years in nobody but your own, it can be hard at times to take a step back and look at yourself with a more objective lens, to try and be more self-aware about the way you act and therefore try to see if there's any way you can change the way you present yourself to no longer be that way. It's something I've been trying to do a lot more in the past year, take a hard look at the way I present myself and see if there's any merit to what's being said. So once again, I ask myself the question, am I too harsh on media? I think to start, it's important to understand how I even got to where I am. You know, I didn't come out of the gates with 400,000 subscribers on an army of fans and detractors. How did I get into YouTube, and furthermore, how did I get to where I am today? Because spoiler warning, this isn't something I was planning. When I first found YouTube back in the late 2000s, I would go on it all the time with my sisters. Prior to that, my only experience with the internet was looking up the name of a Sonic character and trying to draw them on a piece of paper on the floor of my living room, hoping I didn't accidentally wind up clicking on something I probably shouldn't be seeing at that age. I saw YouTube as nothing more than a funny video machine. I'd just sit for hours and watch funny videos of dogs running into walls. Or videos of people singing Hannah Montana parody songs about Homer Simpson. Or the holy grail of my internet childhood, Sonic Paradox. This was literally all I used it for. I had no clue to how much more variety of content there was in the world. Mostly because I was dumb when it came to technology as a kid. I had no idea I could even connect my Wi-Fi to my video game consoles until like 2011. The annoying orange would tell me to subscribe after every video, and when I asked my dad if I could do that, he told me subscribing on YouTube cost him money, so I was terrified of even making an account in the site for years. After a few years, however, I wound up finding a review of 2013's Sonic Lost World by a YouTuber known as Some Call Me Johnny, and it blew me away. Right after finishing it, I watched the entire thing again, and proceeded to binge all of his content along with it allowing me to find out about Let's Play channels like Brain Scratch Coms or The Greek Clement or, or yes, The Game Grumps. No, it's fucking Nickelodeon Guts on SNES! Oh! <laughs> Oh, okay! <laughs> it took me like a year of watching them to even realize that one of the hosts was John Tron. I'm telling you, not the smartest cookie in the jar. Watching all these creators gave me ideas of why I would want to make a YouTube channel if I did it, and what I would do it on. 
but every idea would soon be forgotten once I remembered that I had no clue on how to execute this stuff. My family laptop had also long broken, so I didn't even have any means of making videos at this point. From there, I entered high school at 11 years old. Yeah, in the UK, we skip middle school and just do seven years of high school, with my goal being to eventually go to university for animation. That's when I made a couple of friends, one of them being somebody you all know and love if you watch my channel, The Mouse. At the time, they were all making YouTube channels featuring themselves making Minecraft Let's Plays together as a part of a clan, sort of like, sort of like Dream SMP, except we came up with it first, so you know, fuck you and stuff. This is what really made me want to be a content creator. I had people who motivated me to make content, to which I proceeded to make nothing but videos on my iPad for around a year or two under the name Immortal Resurrection. Yeah, I spelt immortal wrong, what of it? This went nowhere for years. They weren't high quality at all, they were just me playing Minecraft or Sonic or drawing a character in my granny's living room, so it's no surprise that I didn't get any traction. Not that it really discouraged me at all. At that time, 20 views to me was everything. It took me 3 years to reach a grand total of 100 subscribers, and I could not be happier. Especially because I had just gotten a computer all for myself around that time, I could finally start experimenting with making scripted content using Microsoft Word and Camtasia. Dude, if you think my voice is hard to understand now, you clearly have not seen my older videos. Sometimes I feel like I'm being a bit too mean-spirited, a bit too harsh on forces, and I'd like to get other people's perspectives in while I'm doing this, just to like, think to myself, am I being too harsh? Looking back, they're nothing more than poor imitations of some comedy Johnny's reviews, but I still had a lot of fun making them, and it's neat that I can look back and notice all the little weird writing quirks that I still do to this day. Not that it would last long. Around this time I had started using Discord more, and I had a good friend at the time who really liked this one YouTuber you may or may not have heard of known as VealSquam94. Veal likes cartoons, so he makes videos on them. Videos which at the time I felt were very boring and repetitive, with my friend not really understanding what I meant by this. I had started watching a bunch of commentary channels around the time, HH3, HH3, I Heat Everything, I Dubs, Grid A Under A, and I thought, fuck it. I want to summarize my thoughts on why I don't like this guy so my friend understands where I'm coming from. Let's just make a video about it. It's funny to me that the video I was solely making for myself is the one that pretty much kickstarted my channel. This video was a fucking project. I spent like a month or two researching, writing, voicing, and editing this 20 minute rant. When I look back, it's the sort of video I could spend four days making now, but at that point in time it was a colossal effort. More than I'd ever put into any video. And people seemed to like it. It felt like my video was being seen by people other than Sonic fans or two or three of my loyal subscribers, and reached an actual diverse audience. Unbeknownst to me, i just become a commentary channel. From then, I had no idea what to do. Do I continue my path of Sonic discussion videos, or take a stab at becoming what I felt like was a real YouTuber? And knowing that there was another creator I had strong feelings towards at the same time, I thought, eh, why not? What could happen? Chicken. The me who made this video back then would not believe this for the life of you. Looking back and watching the string of commentary videos I made, it's amazing to me that some people look back so fondly on them, like that was some sort of golden age for my channel. Because when I look back, I see some of the shittiest poorly put together videos on my entire channel. There's a lot I appreciate about them and there are certain points where I do understand what I was trying to say, but I think it's obvious my heart wasn't in it. After the butch one popped off, I had a major dilemma. I don't have any more strong thoughts on other YouTubers. I'm not really much of a drama guy, so I don't know where to go from here. Which is mostly why I only made around 10 commentary videos in the span of a year and filled the rest of that time with comment response videos and new series like the long, long forgotten subscriber salvage. Where I would go through a list of my subscribers' channels who wanted me to review their content. This, this lasted two episodes. I wasn't doing this because I actually cared about what I was doing, I was doing it because I wanted to make videos but I had no idea what to talk about. I was so bored that I would desperately try to find new ways to make commentary fun for myself, with the end result being that I really wanted to push this idea of me being a character. You know, it's not me, Mark, saying this stuff, it's Ellis Mark the character. <laughs> you know, get mad at him, not me. By the way, a couple years in, I changed the channel name to Ellis Mark, because some of my friends disbanded and made a new YouTube clan called the Ellis Clan. And no, I'm still not telling people what it stands for. Maybe if I ever reach the elusive 1 million subscribers, so subscribe today, I guess, if you care about that riveting teal. This all culminated in possibly my most famous and heated commentary videos, the Game Grumps rant. 
where I'm completely unabashedly rude and mean and angry towards a Let's Play channel. I wrote that video in a school notebook in my study hall instead of studying for my exams. There's a lot I still agree with in my Game Grumps video, but if I were to make it today it would come out completely different. I just felt I could say whatever I wanted because it was just my opinion which justified all the insults I'd throw. And boy did that ever backfire. The response to that video really made me realize that I didn't like being seen as this massive asshole who doesn't like anything. Because I really didn't feel like I was like that in real life. Still working on that part. It was not a good state for me mentally to be at, and all I knew was that something needed to change. Speaking of school, around this time I had been getting slowly more and more fed up with it, which did not help my attitude when writing videos because again, I was writing them all while in class. At this point I was doing my A-levels, choosing the subjects of art, film, and business studies, with each class taking place in different schools 15 minutes away from each other, because not enough people were picking them to warrant doing them in certain schools. Meaning that when I wasn't in a class bored out of my mind, I was walking to another one holding a school bag, an art folder, tripod, camera, and PE bag on top of wearing an exhaustive amount of clothing with my uniform. It was really beginning to take a toll on me, especially because all the traveling had pretty much cut out all social interaction I was getting at the time. All this made me do was heavily consider going all in on content creation, and if there's one piece of advice I could give to you as a content creator, it's never to go all in. Finish school, have other options, etc, etc. Because I told myself I was going to give myself one more week. One more week of school to decide whether or not I drop out of it in my last year. And... COVID happened, we all got sent home, and I got predicted grades, meaning I didn't have to do a single test and got pretty good scores. So that was nice. I later did drop out of college after finishing the first year because it was, again, during COVID season, meaning it was all done remotely, and I just wasn't getting anything out of that, but anyways. I had a choice to make with my channel. A big choice. Abandon everything I had gotten right after finally achieving some success, or abandon what many people solely knew me for and try something else for a change. I always stuck by the fact that if I were to go back to a different style of content, it would be reviews. I even tried doing that with a review of Monster Family around the time of my Veilskabam video. And so with the Game Grumps video solidifying this idea in my head, I committed to it. This is a very risky move because you're basically not catering your content away from your core audience. In 9 out of 10 cases that kills a channel because the switch is so hard to naturally do. And I think it's safe to say at this point in time, with my channel doing better than ever, I successfully made that switch. Here's a little tip for any aspiring creators out there who may want to do that very thing but worry about losing all momentum their channel has gained. Results may vary obviously, if your channel dies because of this I hold no liability. Try do it as naturally as possible is the biggest advice I could give. I'm in a lucky spot since the way my commentaries were formatted is quite similar to the way a movie review would go, same style of editing and writing, just a different topic. But another way you can do this is to slowly wean your viewers towards the new style. When I started I would make a commentary, then a media review, then a commentary, then two media reviews, then a commentary, then three media reviews, you get the picture. Not everyone is going to stay of course, but you're more likely to find viewers if one style eventually try and give the new format a chance. And who knows, maybe some will like it and decide to watch the next couple too. And that leads us to where we are today. I've been reviewing stuff for about 3 years now and I'd say it's gone pretty well. Sometimes I'll throw a different sort of format into the mix like my nostalgic loneliness or retrospective videos, but for the most part my channel has remained the same ever since. When you've been doing something for so long, you start to notice certain pits you can easily fall into, and this was no exception. Not all my stuff is perfect, and I don't look back on all these videos and agree completely with what I said or the way I presented it. Which is hard for me because I think a lot of viewers have this strange mindset that once a YouTuber stops a video or when they're not in that sort of space that they just shut off like a robot. A big issue I had when starting out on making media reviews is that I still had that mindset of wanting to shit on everything. I had grown up watching cartoon channels like Mr. Enter, where a majority of the videos were yelling about whatever new episode of Teen Titans Go pissed him off that week, so I started trying to do the same thing, which definitely wasn't right. I ended up trying to look at things way more seriously than I believe I do now. For example, one of my first reviews was of the movie Barnyard. I was scathing towards that thing, but when looking back on it, I don't even think at the time I cared that much. In the video, there's so many times when I compliment it, but for some reason felt the title Barnyard is a boring mess fit the way I described it. Same with the Simpsons movie. It's not a film that I think is particularly good, mainly like I say in the video is down to the poor pacing with an incredibly long first act, but I don't feel like I focus enough on all the hilarious gags which there are plenty of, this being my favourite. <laughs> And I definitely didn't give enough credit to the focus Homer's arc is given, of him deciding to redeem himself which builds off why he was being so much of a prick in the beginning. 
being a viewer of this sort of content for so long, I felt like the thing was either good or it was bad, with no in-between. And that grey area in the middle is something that's hard to accurately convey in a video, which only becomes more hard when you add on to the fact that you have to still try and make it appealing to an outsider looking in. Like, which title seems more interesting to you? Barnyard is a boring mess, or Barnyard is a charming mess? Well, okay, maybe that isn't the best example. You know what, there we go. Still though, I think I was worried about my audience not wanting to go for my reactionary commentary videos to my movie reviews that I felt like I needed to format them in the same way. My Simpsons movie review was initially just titled Review, Simpsons Movie, before a friend at the time told me I needed to be more bombastic with it, suggesting the Simpsons movie, beginning of the end. And when I did that, I noticed a significant increase in the attention the video was getting compared to my other film reviews from around that time, so I felt like I had to lean into that more, and I think finding a middle grind between these two is the perfect approach. That's something I feel like I struggle with from time to time, beyond just in the space of thumbnails and titles. Trying to balance objective flaws with trying to make a video that I feel is entertaining still. And a lot of the time I feel like I never articulate my opinions in a way that accurately conveys what I mean, usually struggling to balance that with exaggeration for comedic effect. I think it's important because there's most definitely a way to point out objective flaws on something while still providing your own opinion on it. Like, I enjoy a bunch of movies most people don't, but I'm still able to acknowledge their flaws while admitting I like them. Pointing out the bad in something you find good doesn't make you any less of a fan of it, it just means you can see it for what it is. Which is really bizarre to me, because I oftentimes see folks saying that I used to be nicer in my older videos, but I don't think that's true at all, personally. I believe that more so comes from people yearning for the past and believing that it was better somehow, when in my opinion I'd argue I've only gotten nicer in the way I present my arguments, unless I feel justified in doing so like with my Farzar review. Not even that I think being harsh is necessarily a bad thing. I believe as long as you're consistent in what you're saying and not showing clear bias towards certain things, then you can be as harsh as you want. It's just like your opinion, man. But as of recent, I feel like more than ever, I've been trying to look deeper into why specific media is bad or what could be going on that affects it so much. Like adult animation being run by clueless executives who overwork and underpay animators. See, though, I really don't want to portray this idea that I've never been wrong in anything I've done or said. Like I mentioned at the beginning, this really is just a big video about self-reflection, so it's important to point out where you may have gone too far in a few places. An issue I have is being very reactionary at times, I feel. Sometimes I'll say something without sitting on it for long enough to properly articulate what I want to say, and it results in me coming off like an asshole, which is definitely something I'm trying to get better on about. Even if not, and then I do still slip up. Most recently, this happened with the release of Sonic 2, where I find the movie overall decent, but was still disappointed by the end product. With people arguing me that a title like Sonic Movie 2 is disappointing, betrays the video as much more negative than it actually is, despite it not being a lie. And you're right in that 100%. I'm not gonna lie and say that a part of me wasn't aware that the title was much more reactionary than it maybe could have been. I later went and changed the title after finally realizing that isn't something I want to continue doing. But then that's met with folks claiming that you only do it because of backlash and not because I actually sat down and thought about it for a bit. And since then I can definitely say I've been trying harder to make thumbnails and titles that I think are interesting while still accurately conveying my thoughts and opinions. Another bigger example would be my Mitchells vs. the Machines video, where I really wanted to follow the same kind of formatting I had been doing for my recent reviews of This Thing Is Kinda Bad, but did go more easy on it by simply calling it average. Which looking back marks a moment in my channel that I'm really not happy with. Because I really did not care for the movie, that part isn't a lie. I didn't think it was good or bad, just somewhere in the middle. But because of that, I didn't even want to bother making a video at all. But I ended up doing so anyway because it was the end of a week and I still didn't have a video out and needed one for a sponsor. I really don't like doing that, and the video's response made me realize that I got nothing out of it. There are certain videos on my channel that I know for a fact were only made because I didn't know what else to do that week, and I've been trying harder and harder to solely focus on topics that interest me, even if it means experimenting more, or more time between videos in exchange for a longer one. Anyways, that's not to mention I wanted to justify the move to myself by ignoring all the valid arguments people would make towards what I had to say. I'd say something about the film that represented it wrong, like saying Kitty had no reason to be so mad at her father for the road trip idea, but because I'd only seen the thing once and didn't really care about it enough to rewatch it, I completely forgot about the fact that she was annoyed that she'd miss her orientation, which was a big deal for her. Wasn't done out of maliciousness in any way, but it's still something I failed to recognize and only doubled down afterwards to try and convince myself that I had done the right move by making the video, which I clearly hadn't. 
That's something I try to keep in mind when making videos now, being sure that I actually care about the topic I'm discussing. I didn't bother making reviews of a lot of new stuff that came out like Encanto or Minions 2 or Lightyear, because I seriously could not give less of a shit and I don't want to waste my time on something I'm not passionate about. That's why I think it's important for me to talk about why I make videos in the first place. Is it because I want to show everyone that I have the most correctest opinions on media and want to put them in their place? I think the answer is an obvious no. Why do I make videos then? Because I frequently see people say it's because I can never be happy, and I have to constantly express that fact, but seriously, it's as simple as me enjoying the discussion of this stuff. I really enjoyed English class when I was in school. Yep, I was one of those kids. But I loved being allowed to choose a topic and having to flesh out and articulate my thoughts in an essay. I liked writing a ton. And a lot of those same techniques I learned in school are things that I still carry over when making videos to this day, with the biggest one being P. P stands for point, evidence, explain. I hope others learnt that too, or that would have come off very strange. Basically, it means present the point you want to make, give some evidence towards it being that way, and explain why you think that. It's very helpful in getting your thoughts out, and something I try to do with videos because I like fleshing out my thoughts and why I like or dislike something. That's why I'm so adamant about the fact that I don't see myself as a critic. I don't really intend on changing anyone's mind or believe that my views on something holds any more weight over another person's. There's this idea if you make negative videos, it makes you a negative person who wants to put everything down. But the reality is, it's fun to me to talk about media like this. I enjoy it no matter how pissed off I may sound in a video. I think it's cool that people can see the way I react to all different kinds of media, as it gives you some sort of insight as to what I like and don't like, and why I believe the things I do. You cannot comprehend how happy it makes me when I see people just get the way I look at things. Not necessarily agree, but just get it. It's no secret that my favorite aspect of any show or movie are the characters. Something could have awful animation or a simple story, but as long as I like the people put in those situations, I'm on board. It's why I enjoy a movie like Luca, but didn't enjoy a film like Atlantis. But just because I know what I like doesn't mean I should be forced to only cover things that fit that criteria. Not only because that'd be repetitive and boring, but also because it allows me to branch out and experience other genres or things with a different focus other than the characters. If I only aim to engage with stuff I know I'd like, then I'd have a pretty limited palette and would never challenge myself. I'd never have ended up watching a movie like Treasure Planet, which I absolutely adored. I never wanted to give that film the time of day before and regret it a bunch. I would have never watched Turning Red or revisited stuff from my childhood like Curious George, or seen the Rocky movies for the first time, which come up in my videos way too often. Rocky 2 is still the best one. But because you get to see me cover such a wide range of things, with varying views on each of them, you know that if I recommend something that on the outside wouldn't have appealed to me, then there must be something really special there. And if you tend to agree with my opinions on other things, then you'll probably like it too. That's like the best part of making videos to me, that I can seriously sit down and make a 20 minute character analysis of Brian Griffin and have people understand what I'm talking about. I love that. But no matter what I do or say, it's not gonna change anything. I think that's just a natural result of my videos being so opinionated. And really, I wouldn't have it any other way. Props to the people who do, but I can never make one of those super sanitized videos that go out of their way to try and make everybody happy. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Ellis Mark, and today we're going to be counting down the top 10 Simpsons episodes. Now before we get into it, I want to remind you this list is my own personal opinion. If you disagree with this list, then that's okay. Be sure to let me know in the comments below what your top 10 episodes are. With that being said, we're trying to build a loving community here, so remember to like, comment, subscribe, you know, it's less personal in a way, it's not who I am. And I guess because I feel like my content is so personally attached to me and my thoughts that it's harder not to see this stuff as a personal attack or a judgement on me as a person. That's not me trying to say that it is a personal attack or anything like that, it's just the first irrational thought in my head, you know? I'm in no way trying to say that the people who try to critique me in any way are, are only doing it as a personal attack, you know? But with the people who do, I have to make the most obvious and lame statement ever and say, you don't know me, you don't know what I'm like in real life. All you see are the words in an essay I'm writing to myself. If someone in real life told me they liked Mitchells vs. The Machines, I'd probably say cool. But like I said, it's not something I can really help. It's just the sad byproduct of folks not recognizing the disconnect between online and real life. And the usual response to that is that the biggest issue is not clarifying enough that this is just my own opinion, and if I simply stated that, then things would be fine. But why do I need to say that everything I say in my own personal channel is my personal opinion? Subjectivity should always be implied. And then, on the opposite side, when I do say it's my own opinion, it's not like it fixes anything, it doesn't change the way we discuss that. Trying to act like me or anybody else tries to pass off their opinion as objective fact seems like a cheap tactic to vilify somebody, just for having a different viewpoint than you instead of a genuine criticism. 
and the only people who are gonna believe it are other people who already don't like you, because they have a different opinion from you, so there's no winning trying to have a reasonable discussion with these people. While I'm at it, I also see this lame idea being thrown around where people try to dismiss everything you say about something because, well, you, you just went in wanting to hate it. You were never gonna give it a chance. Which to me comes off like the most insane level of coping ever, where I can't simply look at something and have a negative opinion on it without there needing to be some ulterior motive. Like I'm sitting here like, oh, turning red comes out soon, better start writing the review now since I already know I'm gonna hate it. This'll get me all the clicks like that movie, by the way. I see that a lot, too. People commenting on my reviews before even watching them saying, Boy, I can't wait to see Mark Heat on another new movie that was released. I typical. Only to watch the video and see that I actually in fact enjoyed it because surprise surprise, I don't hate everything I watch. And I'm just sitting here like, isn't that going into my thing being biased and wanting to dislike it? I don't know, I think every YouTuber at some point runs the positive versus negative debate in their head every once in a while, where it's brought to their attention that a majority of their videos are negative and they've got to try and be positive for once. It's so weird to me because usually the people saying that they'd wish you'd do this don't even watch your stuff nor care about it, so it's not like they'd be watching the positive videos anyway. I've been positive in plenty of videos and what do you know they are more often than not the most consistently least viewed videos on the channel like Curious George or The Bad Guys. Am I bringing this up because I want people to watch those videos and I'm complaining about views? Not at all. Don't watch them if you don't want to. I make those videos more so for myself more than anything. But I'm simply bringing up the point that if people don't really want to see negative reviews so much, you'd think they'd click on the positive ones. It's almost like they don't really care either way and just want to generalize somebody as being negative, so it justifies them in not needing to hear them out and what they have to say. If you can find a way to vilify the person who disagrees with you, then do so, so you don't even have to consider their arguments on a cartoon show. I had been thinking about this topic so much that I decided to just sit down and do the math. How many of my videos are negative versus how many are positive? And out of 94 videos, skipping the commentary era, you want to know how many of them were purely negative? Not counting the larger ones where I'm both positive and negative at points? 54. I beg your pardon? That's 57%, just over half. Wanna know how many there are if I don't include negative videos where I'm in the majority? Where I'm purely being negative and that isn't the popular opinion? That is 9% of my videos. I was being generous too and including movies that I was either mixed about and everyone liked, or movies that were mixed and I didn't like. And this isn't me trying to say that I'm not negative on my channel or that it's overly positive. Like, I'm not in denial here, I'm fully aware that I'm pretty negative. But I think that more so comes from the snide remarks and sarcastic comments that I usually make, which I usually try to tone down on now when not clearly being used as a joke. This genuinely surprised me, because even I was of the belief that I was being too negative and thought there were more than that. Obviously, everyone is gonna have different views on what constitutes as a positive and negative video, or what's a liked product and a disliked product, but I don't think the room for error would be that significant for the point to be any less apparent. How come every time this guy shows up in my timeline, it's something negative? Oh, I don't know, could it possibly be because I don't get 500 quote tweets about me talking about how much I love Curious George? Where's the attention for my tweet praising Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium? Go watch that movie, by the way, it's really good. That's just the way the internet works. People feed off of negativity. If you are someone who makes those comments, you yourself are feeding the negativity. If you want to see less of that type of content, then do yourself a favor and stop engaging with it. It's not my fault that you think I'm negative while only engaging in my negative content. I don't care if you don't want to watch my positive videos, but don't tell me I don't make them. This is so lame to talk about, isn't it? It comes off as so whiny to have to sit and listen to a YouTuber moan about the way people perceive them on the internet. You know, boo-hoo, I gotta make YouTube videos for a living. Don't worry, I'm well aware. But this really is the only time and place I feel like I can just sit down and express this. As when I've tried to do so in the past in regards to specific scenarios, it always feels like it's something that I'm in the wrong for talking about or calling out. I made this Sonic Movie 2 response video to vocalize my frustrations with the way people responded so harshly to a review where the general consensus was, eh, it was decent. Especially since the movie had only been released in the UK at the time, so a lot of people who had an issue with my points hadn't even seen said movie they're defending. And I admit this was not the best way to go about this, I'm aware I don't help myself with the way I've responded to this stuff, since at the time I really stopped caring about the way it came off. 
but when I made said video where I blurred out the comments from people who I believe were making wrongful statements about me, I had folks coming to me telling me that I should be ashamed for advocating a dogpile on these people when that was never the intention. It baffles me that somebody can just do that, go on the internet and tell lies, and when I simply call it out for being false, I'm suddenly the bad guy, just because I have the bigger follow count. Again, it comes off as a shitty attempt to vilify somebody you don't like for sympathy because you got called out for blatantly lying about them. Again, over something petty like a video game or a cartoon. I guarantee you, there are gonna be people who have a problem with this video even existing because I guess I'm supposed to just sit back and let people say whatever they want because they didn't know you were gonna see that, as if that makes any difference. I will say, however, this is the last time I'm going to talk about this topic. Again, this video is meant to just be sort of a final words on the matter, which is why I'm making sure to cover all my ground. Like, I want to reiterate for the thousandth time here, I'm not attempting to change anyone's minds about me. Not like it even worked, because even when I'm positive, it feels like there's no winning. There's no outcome where I'm happy. When I uploaded the Spongebob ranking video a month or two ago, I was not expecting the response it got from a lot of people. I knew the Spongebob community probably wouldn't be happy with me not being a fan of the later seasons, but what I wasn't expecting was for folks to be mad at me because I thought the first three seasons were the best of the show. Angry because, well, that's, that's what everybody says. Usually, I get the complaint that I'm too contrary, and so the opposite was a shock to me. It's the harsh reality of the situation, but people only say that so much because it's true. There's no other way I can put it. But then I'd see others say that, of course he just shits on everything after season 3, what do you expect? And it confuses me because these are the same people who admit to not even watching the video and skip to the very end to watch the rankings, thinking that because something isn't in the top 50 that I must believe it's bad somehow. I felt like I was harsh towards a lot of season 1, 2, and 3, yet nobody talked about that. Everybody was talking about me being harsh on the leader stuff just because that's the popular opinion. I feel like there were a lot of episodes after season 3 I enjoyed and praised a ton. Even a lot of season 4 I wasn't that harsh towards, liking a lot of the episodes but overall feeling like it was a downgrade from the previous season. But because you're only watching the end ranking, and seeing me put them before the golden age, you assume that I must have been negative about it all. When you skip past the discussion, you miss all the nuance of the conversation. You miss the episodes here and there that I praise, you miss all the clips that I show for almost every episode, even the later ones, which are nice times out of 10 jokes that I find really funny, and I'm playing them so you can hopefully laugh at them too. It's like watching an IGN review and skipping to see the number at the very end and getting mad about it. You didn't even hear what they had to say, how do you know you disagree? It's weird to me because more times than not, it's the most positive people who wind up being the most toxic, not the other way around. People desperately want to try and reaffirm that they have the correct view and will be justified in feeling that way about it. That so many just aim to attack your character instead of talking to you about it. They want you to like everything so bad, to the point where they're gonna sit and throw ad hominems towards a person as if that would ever bring them to your side. Unless it's a thing that the grand majority is negative about, in which case, bash it all you want. This is the vocal minority, I'm well aware. There are also the people who just genuinely disagree with you, and that's that, and that's perfectly fine. But if I'm to respect that as just their opinion, then why isn't the same applied to me? Because I own a YouTube channel? Maybe it's my fault for expecting genuine discussion out of such a reactionary site. I really shouldn't be looking to Twitter for real human emotion, I'm aware that's my fault. That's mostly why I've been seldom using my Twitter anymore for anything other than posting a dumbass meme from my camera roll. Although every now and then I decide to run my mouth and pay the price, and I always end up regretting it, because there is nothing harder than trying to have a proper discussion with someone within the limited space of a 240 character tweet. Ultimately, the main response to all this is gonna simply be, why do you care? And as much as I tell myself I don't, you know, I'm making a whole video about it. I guess it's because I want to understand, but I know no answer is gonna satisfy me. I'll never be satisfied with any one reason because at the end of the day, everybody has a different opinion. Especially with something as subjective and unmeasurable as a human emotion like negativity or harshness. Something I think about every now and then is that I'm not really part of any kind of community or fandom online. Sure, I dip my toes in a lot of them like Storytime or Animation or Cartoons or Sonic or FNAF. I've got a lot of great friends in each of those but I'd never really say that I'm actively participating in any of them. And even when I try to, I still find it hard to connect with people on a larger scale and keep to myself. I guess every now and then I just think about that, and it makes me sort of feel like an outsider looking in with each of these communities. Not that I really care at the end of the day, I've got a great group of close friends who I spend my time with, and I think getting too attached to online social media is pretty unhealthy, but it's still something I think about. So at the end of the day, all I can really say is, hey, I'm Mark. I make videos about my thoughts on movies and shows, throw a game in the mix every now and then. 
I got a Sonic channel where I rant about that rabbit hole to no end, so if it interests you, check it out. And I got a podcast coming out soon, where I interview different creators that have inspired me over the years like Butch Hartman or Jeff Kinney. I'll link it when it comes out. And that's kinda it. I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing and continue to learn from my mistakes. I appreciate it if you like that and want to stick around, but if you don't, it's alright too. <laughs>